But it fails. Would you be so kind as to wake Sean up, please? <coughs> Ready, Sean? <coughs> Bit tired after your lunch? <coughs> Got that? Yep, Catherine's laws. Okay, so. Ready? Oh, Hurry up, goodness sake, there's only two words. Or if you want, you can say Kepler's tree laws. Because as we know, you must have tree laws to be important. Two laws, you're just a Kirchhoff, nobody likes you. Tree laws, you're a Newton, everybody likes you. Uh, okay, Kepler's tree laws. Right, so Kepler's first law states that, oh, well, just as a little bit of a background before we dive into this, uh, Kepler was before Newton, okay, so actually predates Newton, and Kepler's work was on motion of planets. Now, you might not think that's a big deal, but you must remember, before Newton, there wasn't mechanics. So Kepler was trying to do something where there was no physics for what he was studying. It wasn't until Newton, until Newton's law of gravity, that we actually can describe what planets are doing. So Kepler, all these laws Kepler formed, he formed these laws simply by observation of what planets do. So he looked through literally hundreds and hundreds of records of motion of planets and their times on orbit and all this, and came to these three laws. So it's quite impressive because he had no theory to do this, he only had data observation. Okay? Uh, so Kepler's first law for planets is quite simple. Simple for us now, but at the time in like, what's it, 1500, like 500 years ago, it wasn't simple or obvious. Uh, Kepler states that bodies in orbit of the sun, or other large masses, will move either in a circle or, and this is kind of the interesting thing, it's not just a circle it's or elliptical path, which means, you know, a, a, a sort of stretch circle like this. Now, I know that's obvious for us, but at the time, perhaps it would be reasonable to think planets only move in a circle. I think it would be nice to draw the picture with the word elliptical so you can remember that word elliptical path. I would hope you all know circular path. It would make me quite sad if you didn't. What is circle? What the circle? Yeah. Me, please. I need to keep some energy for the January students after this, okay? You can't run it down. Did you have classes down? Yeah, I have two hours after. Yeah, physics. Yeah. Bruce, yeah. <laughs> we I'll pass on the message. Oh, nice to meet you. Maybe I should pretend he's a new student. What's your name? What country are you from? <laughs> China, interesting. Do you know Jerry? He's from China too. <laughs> Actually I think I will do that. Uh, okay, you got that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, Jerry. This formula. What's the formula? You know this formula. So I said this can be proved from Newton's law. But remember, Kepler was before Newton, so Kepler didn't have this law. Interesting. Uh, okay, continue. The proof is a little bit too difficult for this course. It might be something you might do in physics at university, but you can prove that such a formula would cause circular motion. Now, the, the, the formula is a little bit tricky to prove that because, for example, you know that uh, uh, force for circular motion is m omega squared r, isn't it? Whereas in this formula, you can see the r is actually in the denominator, and you might say, well, that 
means then it's not a circle, it's not like this. But remember last time I proved that the formula for the potential energy simplifies down to uh, mgh. So in the same way you can kind of show that this can become a circular or, a, a circular or elliptical motion. Yeah. Um, but it's not for us to do. Okay, what's Kepler's second law? Uh, no, I think I have this. I can't remember if I mixed up the second and the third, but it doesn't really matter. I think I have it the right way around. So Kepler's second law states that the area swept out by an orbiting body per unit time is constant. What the heck does that mean? Well, mathematically you can say it a few different ways, but one convenient way to say it is V1 R1 equals V2 R2. But what exactly does that mean? Just before you write this down, let me explain. Do you see this picture? You think you know this one? Um, here the Earth moves this far in one month. And here the Earth moves this far in one month. Now, here because it's closer, um, this is actually longer. So what's happening is the Earth is moving faster here and slower here. And it will move in such a way that these areas are equal. So it doesn't matter if it's per month, per second, per day, or per week. The area that is made, the area which is uh, swept out, this area swept out doesn't change per unit time. This is Kepler's second law. Now, how do you make that as a formula? The way you can make that as a formula is as follows. V1 R1 equals V2 R2. Then if you multiply the radius and the velocity here, you get the same answer as multiplying the, uh, the radius and the velocity here. So this is Kepler's second law. And actually, I won't bother proving the results because it's not on the exam. But the proof is not too, too difficult, but it's a bit unnecessary for this course. The unit? Oh, the unit would be like uh, meter squared per second is constant. Yeah. How did he find that? It's quite amazing, isn't it? But he found this out by looking at. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's quite amazing. He had to look at all these numbers, all this data, and notice this result. Big data. This is 500 years ago, big data, yeah. Huh? You can prove this using, you can prove this using Newton's gravity. I know! This is why Kepler is a very smart Rich. man. Great. Yes. No, I don't think he's an alien. I think he's smart. You know, so Newton gets all the credit. There's other people too that did impressive work before Newton, like Kepler. Uh, no. This, yeah. What's or? Radius. I know, yeah, the or here and here are different. Oh, you mean here and here? Yeah, I know, it's kind of, so it's kind of an approximation, but if you look over a small enough time, if you look over one second, it's definitely fine, because the radius hardly changes over one second. But even over one month, it's not too bad. I suppose if you want to be very technical about it, you could use like the average radius because that's usually what's used, you know. But this formula is just a simplification of the result. I mean, if you if you wanted to write it down mathematically, I suppose you would say the a d t is constant. That would be the precise mathematical formula. But that's not that's too difficult, or not too difficult. That's more difficult than what we need it to be to have useful results. Because then you have to write down a formula for A, and because it's a circle, it's not even a circle, it's a, an ellipse, then it's a little bit messy. If it was a circle, it would just be, you know, using pi r squared. Because it's an ellipse, 
it's unnecessarily complicated and it doesn't really make it much more accurate. Uh, okay. Teacher, yeah. Um, can we say A1 equals A2? Yeah, A1 equals A2. But really, like I was saying to the KJ, it's more the, the rate of change of the A1 is equal to the rate of change of A2. So you could say A1 per unit time. Like you could say delta A1 over delta T1 equals delta A2 over delta T2. But this really, this is being much more precise than you need for the exam, much, much more precise. In fact, I don't even know if you'll get an exam question on this because it's too straightforward, the formula. I doubt it. It's Kepler's third law where they have the exam question. So Kepler's third law. Continue. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Kepler's third law states that the periodic time squared is proportional to the radius cubed. That t squared is proportional to r cubed. That that is the relationship between the time and the radius. There for one sec. Thank you. So what does that mean precisely? So roughly speaking it means that if the radius is twice as big then about not quite, not quite, but nearly. If the radius is twice as big then the time is about three times as big, although it's not quite three, it's a little bit less than three. But roughly, if the radius is doubled, <coughs> it would mean that the time to orbit is tripled. Roughly, roughly. Um, but in fact, you can write this as a precise formula. Now this formula I'm about to give you was not known, I don't think Kepler knew this form. no Kepler didn't have this formula. Kepler just had this one, t squared is proportional to r cubed. But in fact, we know the exact relationship from, New from Newton, we can get the exact relationship as this, that uh, t squared is this constant times r cubed. Actually, no, that's not true to say, I'm sorry. I think Kepler did know this constant, but he didn't know how it was made. He would have just had the number value, perhaps. Because obviously Kepler didn't know about the g constant. Because the G only comes from Newton's law. Okay? Now, good news. This proof of this formula is in the exam. And it's one of the three proofs that you can be asked in the exam. So if you remember, there are three proofs on the exam. First proof is UVATS formulas. The second proof involves the E and the log, using the log to change an E formula into a linear formula. We did this in electricity. Remember this? Yeah. And then the third proof on the exam, and the final proof on the exam, is the proof of this formula. Let us prove it now. Ready? Mm -hmm. So please write this proof down carefully. It is the third and final proof on the exam. Okay. So we have a big M and we have a small M. All I've done is draw two planets, a sun and a, a, a planet, that's all. Okay, so Newton said F equals G M M over R squared, where the F will say is this one. 
and Newton also said f equals m omega squared r. Right? So, together, that makes g m m over r squared must equal m omega squared r. What can I cancel? Um, Which one? The small one. So I can get g m equals omega squared or cubed. But what does omega equal? Pi, pi, two pi over t. Yeah, two pi over t. So this becomes four pi squared over t squared or cubed. Which means we get t squared equals 4 pi squared over g m or cubed. Yeah, you see, this is what, this, now KJ, this is a perfect example of what I mean. We all agree, this is simple, and I can do this. And then the exam comes around, and you're like, huh, circle, you say. <laughs> why it's important to practice exam papers. You might shock yourself at what you forget. But the proof is not too difficult. Okay? That's really it. This, please note this formula is not in the book. Uh, you need to know the proof. And there are some questions where it's very, very helpful to use this formula. But because it's not in the book, you'll have to memorize it or prove it. But if you do remember this formula, for questions that use this formula, you can simply say by using Kepler's formula. But you'll have to remember it because it's not in the book. But it's a real time saver. Okay, did you write this proof down? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not crazy difficult. It is. Well, I don't think so. Right, continue. Okay, some more definitions. I believe this is a term some of you already know from your coursework one essay. No. Didn't you? Oh no, you did roller coaster. Sorry, I think of last year's students. Uh, a geostationary orbit or packing orbit. Does anybody know what this is? Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's not. I know packing. Well, I know packing. You only have it half right. Because it's not just sitting in space, not moving. Because it would fall back down. Yeah, but it's not just sitting in orbit. Is it going around the Earth? How could it be going around and not moving? What precisely do you mean? Yes. Yeah, but what's a parking orbit or geostationary orbit? What type of orbit? The special type of orbit. Moving orbit. And, uh, They're all moving orbits. It's non-moving orbits because of the space. Mm, no. Why? What do you mean in place, though? <coughs> Is it moving or not moving? What? So it's just sitting in space. No, no. Pass. Uh, right. Geostationary or packing orbit. Sean just looked it up in the dictionary. Um, Sean, do you want to tell us in English? Ah, go on. The radius? No. <laughs> it's an orbit around the Earth or the planets which has a periodic time t of one day. So yeah. geostationary orbit means the t equals one day. Now why is that a big deal? Because, think about this. Here is uh, our planet. Yeah. We'll call it planet X. We yeah, we'll, we'll just keep it general. And here's the thing in orbit. Yeah. That's moving around. If this has a one day time, yeah. and this is also one, one day, day, of course, it means that for people sitting on the always surface, it, 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 it always looks like it's above them. Yeah. Because it will move together if, yeah. if they're both one day. 
So for the Earth, this is 24 hours. Yeah. So this is why it's called the Parkin orbit, because to the people on the surface, it always looks like it's in the same place. But of course, everybody is moving together. Yeah. This is, why would you want to have your satellite in such a way? Like, what's the advantage? Ah, yeah, but you can still record what happens if it's moving. Like, what might be an advantage to having your satellite stuck in one place in the sky? Mm -hmm. Think about what satellites are used for. Maybe you give you an idea. GPS. GPS. GPS works because the satellites appear to be in the same place. They act like reference points in the sky. So, for example, this could be GPS number 123 and this one let's imagine it's always over Ireland and then there's another one here which is maybe always over the UK so if you're here and your GPS connects and sees this and connects and sees this by using a bit of trigonometry it can work out where you are mm -hmm. the GPS system uses trigonometry and the location of these are broadcast things they're fixed in the sky yeah. There's another advantage though, you can use GPS, or not GPS, satellites for TV. Mm. So obviously if you pay, if you're an American company and you pay to broadcast your television over the US, you wouldn't really like your satellite moving over other countries mm -hmm. if you are paying and providing for US customers. No. Yeah. That's a really large channel. But we are moving. Yeah. 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 Satellites moving at the same rate. It appears stopped. The T is equal. T's, the T's are equal. Yeah. Yes. So GPS and satellite TV. Because uh, when you look at your house, the satellite dish always points to the same place in the sky. They don't need to move it during the day. Yeah. Huh? Is this what happened on Earth? This really happened, sir. The whole time the moon is always on the top. Huh? What do you mean? The moon isn't geostationary. Oh. It will appear to move through the sky and be at different places. Now, it, you know, you don't notice this, but in fact, if you look at the moon through a telescope, you can actually see it moving. Because you'll fix on the moon, and then maybe three minutes later, it's maybe over here. So you can actually see it moving through the night sky. Another way you can see it is if you have a camera, uh, you can have it on a, you know, a time lapse, take a picture every 60 seconds, then you can see it, you can track its movement through the sky. So it's not geostationary. Now uh, what's interesting about the moon is that um, I think it also may, but it also I think has the same length. Of, it's also a 24 hour rotation I believe which means the same half always points to the earth mm -hmm. so you, you, it's impossible to see the back of the moon from earth because the same side points towards it every time it's a coincidence it's also a coincidence that the moon is the same size as the sun in the sky mm -hmm. you know you think about an eclipse an eclipse works because the moon travels in front of the sun it's a total coincidence that they're the same size. I mean, if the moon was smaller than the sun in the sky, then there would be no eclipse. But they're perfectly, exactly the same size. Again, just a coincidence. Or is it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, did you write that down? No. Yeah, geostationary. Oh, sorry, you didn't, yeah. know the sun is bigger than the moon. I, I, know, I, I, I know, I mean in our vision, I did the same. Yeah, the same. The no, the same. No, I saw the picture, isn't it like the sun is like this and the moon is on this side as well. The sun may look bigger because of it, 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 it's lit up, but the actual disk is the same shape as the moon. Not, not roughly the same, but you know, exactly the same in the sky.
Tom. Or Buddha, whoever. Whichever, whatever preference you have. Stephen Hawkins, whatever you believe in. I'm trying to be multicultural here, okay? So how can they match that the anything It's quite difficult but um well, no, it's just quite difficult to match because it just needs a lot of energy. You see, geostationary orbits are actually very, very high orbits. You have to have your satellite in an extremely high orbit, uh, and it has to be spinning. It has to be traveling around the Earth really fast. To get it into that position requires, you know, a lot of energy. You have to make sure that when the rocket gets up to the orbit, then it heads in a, you know, it, it curves. Uh, and it's given enough speed so that when it gets into orbit, it's going fast enough to stay uh, in the right position and the right speed. It's um, it, it's difficult, not because it's hard to match, but because it needs a lot of energy. That's the difficult part. Like really, really high orbits. If you like, for example, the International Space Station would not be in such a high orbit. Because the periodic time for the International Space Station is like an hour. It might even be less. So it would orbit the Earth several times a day, it's moving around. You think so, yeah? Huh? Yeah. So they would, you know, they would see sunrise maybe 20 times a day. Yeah. Huh? Pretty nice place. Yeah. Why can And the space station it orbits twenty times a day, the Earth. So they would the, ast the astronauts on the space station would see sunrise twenty times a day. They'd see it like about every hour. You know, they'd see the sun come up uh, behind the Earth. Yeah. Yes, it is pretty cool. Huh? Did they die? Then they're dead. Uh, okay. How do they sleep? Are we hours? Uh, no, 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 no. They still stick with 24-hour days. But it does mess up your body clock, as you can imagine. Having sunrise and sunset every hour. Oh, it looks like our body clock. Oh, yes! It it even, I mean, I saw in the working hours like, when we wake up and then you start counting. No, 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 no. Your body clock is synced to the sunlight. Oh, so we sleep early, I mean we sleep earlier during winter because the sun... Well, this is what our body would like to do, but we have lots of artificial light, oh. so it, uh, But on the space station, they, you know, they would have to pull the window shut, I'd imagine, to stop the sunrise every hour from waking them up when they're trying to sleep, you know? Uh, no, we don't have this problem in Dublin anyway, it's night time year round. Oh, it's clouds. Uh, okay. Um, this is an example, KJ, you were asking me uh, about how to match it. So in this question, you have a small satellite and it's in a parking orbit around the Earth. How far is it from the surface of the Earth? The surface of the Earth, not the center of the Earth. Okay? So let's calculate this together. What we can do for this one is use... Well, do you want to try it? You can actually just use... Um, you just need to use this formula. Yeah. Because which things do we know? T. Do we know T? Yeah, uh, we yeah. want to know this. Yeah. We know this, 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 and do we know the M? Yeah. I give it to you. Yeah. Okay, so use Kepler's third law here and uh, tell me what you get for the radius. And don't forget to subtract this from your answer because mm -hmm. I want the distance from the surface, not from the center. Can you try? In which one? In which lesson? I don't remember which one. Might be similar, but the inform information provided might be different. Hmm? What do you think? Yes. Yes, seconds. Yes. Calculate. Mm -hmm. 
6.67 multiplied 10 to the minus 11. It is also on your calculator if you flip open the lid. So, what I'll do, or what you'll do, is just rewrite this as r equals cube root yeah. 4 pi squared over gm t squared, if you want to, yeah. minus, what? Oh, did I, no, what are you talking about? I didn't write anything wrong. Uh, r equals cube root gm t squared over 4 pi squared minus... Six three seven one oh oh oh. Well, I can put in the four pi. Uh, Sean, what is the mass of the Earth, please? Okay. okay. 5.97 times 10 to the 24. Times T squared, and the T is 24 times 3,600. That's the T squared. Oh, seconds, of course, yeah. Oh no. So, this is the answer. Let's just put that in kilometers. 35,900 kilometers. Now, how big did I say the Earth was? The Earth was about 6,000 kilometers. So, just to put that in perspective, if that is 6,000, then that would be about. That's about, it's about 36,000. So it's about 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 radius of the Earth. Yeah, um, yeah well, 7 from here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, 6 to 1. Yeah. 6 to 1. So that's what I meant, uh, KJ is in a huge orbit, whereas the International Space Station might only be around about here. Did you get there? GPS could be this high, yeah. Uh, I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Where's GPS? GPS would be like up here. Where's the moon? Oh, the moon's still a good bit more than this, yeah. Where's that? Oh, oh come on, someone has more than six radius. Uh, the further, again, because of Kepler, the bigger the R, the bigger the T. So higher orbits would take more than 24 hours. Lower orbits would take less than. Uh, so I think the common orbits used are the 24 and for some reason the 12. Because surveillance satellites, you know, the satellites that maybe the CIA use, they would like to have it moving around the Earth. So I think they sometimes use a 12-hour cycle. So the, two, the, the levels would be 6 radii, 3 radii, and maybe for space station and other things, scientific, like telescopes and all that, would be maybe this distance here. Teacher, what, what is the R in the formula? The from the oh, yes. So that's why I took this number away, because my question was what's the distance from the surface. But the R is from the center. But isn't it 6,379 kilometers have to cube? No, so it is not. If you put in the formula, the R will be... This, uh, this here gives me the R. The R from the center to here. So I just have to minus that from it. For my answer for R. This is R. Continue? Yeah. Yeah?
ないんです。The planet Mars is observed to be on average 228 million kilometers from the sun. So, here is the sun, here is Mars. Sorry, I should really... Yeah, I know, Sean, I know. A little bit better, Mars. And this distance here is 228 million kilometers. Okay? And one year, so the time here is uh, 687 Earth days. Earth days, yeah. So that's the time. That's the radius. Okay. What is the mass of the sun? Now, KJ, you were asking me. How can you measure the mass of planets? This is a perfect example. How could we know the time it takes Mars to orbit the Sun? Yeah, but how can we know it's 687 days? Yeah, just from looking at it, we can know. True? Just look at it in a telescope. Look at what? Mars. Mars. Yes. Yes. Mars, the planet Mars. Oh, planet Mars. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Fourth planet. Yes. We're a third planet. Mm. Mercury, Venus, Earth, mm. Mars. Jupiter. Jupiter, Saturn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, did you just give him the Chinese of Mars? That's Mars? Yeah, no. Yeah. Fair planet. Yeah. Gold planet. Oh. <laughs> yes. What's your planet? Fair planet. Is that what it translates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Blind planet. Uh, yeah. Mood planet. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> anyway, my point is, um, this is something you can observe through a telescope. Now, what about the distance? You can calculate. And in fact, I made you do a question like that in semester one, the trigonometry. I had you use the sine and cosine rule to calculate how far away a planet is. So by using a telescope, you can observe the distance and the time. And from only this observation, it's enough to work out the mass of what it is orbiting, in this case, the sun. Because by using Kepler's law, uh, what was Kepler's law? T squared equals... Uh, 4 pi squared over g m r cubed. The m, is it the small m or the big m? It's the big m. We can get m equals 4 pi squared r cubed over g t squared. And we can get the mass of the sun. So let's calculate it. Okay, so that is 4 times pi squared times r cubed over g times t squared. And uh, what was the radius? 228 two two times 10 power 9. So this is the mass of the sun. 1.99 times 10 to the 30. Now, if you have Google open, hit in Mars of the Sun, and we can see how close we are. Now, these are real numbers. This is the real distance for Mars and the real time for Mars. What is 687? Hmm? What is the 687? The orbit time for Mars. Okay. From observing it in the night sky. How long it takes to be back in the same position it was. But all this rotating too. True. So I mean, it's not as simple as I'm making it sound. But you can you can compensate for this. 
You just have to consider it in your trigonometry calculations. Uh, I'm picturing something like this, uh, Lee. So if this is the Sun and this is the Earth and this is Mars, mm -hmm. because Mars takes longer to travel, let's say you, uh, uh, let's make our calculation easy and we start our observation when all three line up. So you're here and you can see Mars and you know that this is exactly 12 hours after uh, noon. So maybe this is noon and then 12 hours later you're here and you know that you're exactly on the other side because it's uh, exactly 12 hours later and you can see Mars is directly perpendicular to the ground. So it would appear you know, perpendicular to the surface. Well, in other words, you have to point your telescope uh, straight out rather than at an angle to the horizon. Uh, then maybe, let's say, I don't know, a month later, the Earth. Well, put it here. Uh, the Earth is here. Uh, would Mars be further? No. Or less? Less. No. It'd be less. It'd be because it's about two years for the Earth. It'd be somewhere like maybe like here. Now, I'm not drawing this great, but again, in this picture, there's an angle here, whereas previously it was 90. And this angle is just the angle the telescope makes with the ground. So could you know this angle? Uh, you could. So in, um, imagine this is where the ground is, and this is where the ground is. So you'd have to measure it at an angle theta. Uh, we know this angle, and we would know this distance. Um, and previously we'd know this distance and just by drawing the triangles I'm sure that you'd be able to work out um, like for example how far it's moved and then you could work out oh, how long it would take to do the full circle you know, there's something like that it's not as impressive or difficult as you might think it would be because people have been doing this for hundreds and hundreds uh, no sorry even thousands of years yeah. Uh, okay. The next part is what is the average velocity? Okay, so what could we use to get the V now? No, just yeah. V equals uh, omega r, which equals two pi r over t. Do we know the two pi r and t? We do. Um, what number is this? This is the m, so I don't want that. Two pi. Uh, what's the OR228? And then the T. Big number or small number? The speed of Mars. Yeah. Uh, I'm expecting it bigger. Let me double check that. 2 pi OR over T. Oh yeah, sorry, this is per second. 24 kilometers per second. Faster than hurt. Yeah. Per second. Mars travels 24 kilometers through space. Is that related to the vacuum? There's no resistance. Yes, there's no resistance. The vacuum, so. Pretty fast. Earth would be probably somewhere like, I don't know, maybe near 20, I'm not 100% sure, sure. Less than this, but still fast. Well, you are holding on to one right now. Well, the only reason you would feel it is if there was air, which is not, you see. This is the thing. You can be on an object moving 100 kilometers per second. In the vacuum of space, you have no sense of the speed because there's no air pushing against your face. Nothing will happen, yeah. Yeah. This is an important result in physics, that no matter how fast the object's going, it's going through a vacuum, 
the people on the object have no way of knowing that you're actually moving. That the only way to know you're moving is by looking at other objects moving. So for example, uh, if we were on a planet where there was nothing else, no sun, no other stars, and we were going at 24 kilometers a second, we wouldn't, it could be a 200 kilometers a second, we have no way of knowing it. It, it can only be known from looking at other objects moving by. Uh, this was first discovered by Galileo, actually. Yeah. But then if there was wind, it's like an external force, you would then know. If there was wind, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Next, and finally, uh, the orbit of Mars is not a circle, it's actually uh, an ellipse, and it actually changes by about 20 million kilometers, and it's near, yeah, so what's happening with uh, Mars So there's the Sun, there's Mars. It's actually more of an ellipse. At its furthest distance, it's actually 228. Uh, sorry, it's uh, oh, its nearest distance, it's actually 207 million kilometers. Uh, at its furthest distance, I didn't tell you. And at the average distance, it's... Uh, what did I say? Uh, 228. Uh, so I don't know what that this is, but maybe it's like 240 or something like that. So that V I got here, that's actually when it's here. I want to know how fast it's going here. Yeah, or I can just use my formula. V2 R2 equals V1 R1. So V2 would just be R1 over R2 V1. So I just take this number, and I, I could just multiply it by 207 over 228, and the millions cancel, and the kilometers cancel. So you're just left with, oh sorry, I had that upside down, apologies. 228 over 207. So 26.6. .6. So here it's going at 26.6 kilometers per second. It's going faster. What is the water? Hmm? How is it given in the question? What the I I'll give you distances in the question. Now notice KJ, I said what is the linear velocity approximately because of the point you acknowledged earlier. Yes? We're okay with this? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Okay. So you can see for this lesson we will need some circular motion formulas and we'll need to use Kepler's third law and second law. Alright, continue. So I think the next thing is just questions. Just one question. I'm getting closer to getting. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Maybe. No, if you say this week, we'll get it next week. Yeah, so if you say next week, we'll get it in three weeks. Last week, yes, yeah, so I'll have it for you last week. <laughs> Anyways, you have all the questions. You just want them printed out for your notebook, is it? Yeah. I have three of them prepared. I'm about seven lessons behind. So I'm closing the gap. Okay, can I stop the video? But I'll leave these quest this question here for you to try.